today, especially in view of this uh, rather inclement weather that we are uh, that we're facing. Thank you for braving the the elements, and uh, it's good to see everyone. As I was doing the Bible reading uh, that we we're doing as a congregation this year, we came to the story of Joseph and his brothers. And as I read that story, um, there leapt into my mind a memory of one of my favorite movies of all time, the 2000 uh, Mel Gibson movie, The Patriot, in which he plays the role of a soldier who had a long history. And as the Revolutionary War began, the movie begins with his voiceover saying, I have long feared that my sins would return to haunt me, and the cost is more than I can bear. And as I read the story of Joseph's brothers and the things that they had done to Joseph, that story resurfaced in my thinking. Because it seems to me that that so much characterizes the life, the entire life from that point forward of these brothers. You may recall uh, the story that they had committed a tremendous evil against their brother, which provoked this sense of guilt within them. They didn't like their youngest brother. He was the favored son of their aged father. And he made his favoritism known, and that created resentment and envy on their part. And so on one occasion, when they saw Joseph approaching, they concocted a scheme to do away with him. And as one thing led to another, they eventually settle on the plan that they would take him and sell him to some slave traders who were on their way to Egypt. And so for 20 pieces of silver, the cost of a common slave, they sold their flesh and blood into bondage. And yet as soon as the deed was done, you can imagine their thought process as they begin to think of, well, what if our deed is discovered? What's going to happen to us if it's found out what we did to Joseph? And so they came up with a plan, and it seemed like a good plan. It says, beginning in Genesis 37, beginning in verse 31, that they took Joseph's robe, which they had stripped him of, and they slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in the blood. And they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, this we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. And he identified it and said, it is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn in pieces. I wonder again, thinking of it from the brother's perspective, how they must have felt as their father processed the significance of this bloody coat that he held in his hands. And as his imagination went to the devouring and the tearing to pieces of his beloved son, how they, they felt as, as they watched him process that, did they have a pain of remorse and guilt over what they had done? And did they begin to think about the cries that Joseph uttered as he pled with them, we're told in another place in the story, pled with them not to do to him what they had devised to do and how they ignored his pleas. Well, they stuck to their plan. I mean, once you've gone this far, you might as well ride it out. And, and they needed that plan because undoubtedly without it, J Jacob, their father, would have conducted an inquiry. He would have had an investigation unleashed to, to find his son. But with this, this, this garment soaked in the blood of a goat, he was convinced that his son was dead and there was no further need for inquiry. And so for 27 years, these men live with the idea that their sin has been covered. But there were two problems, one theological and one psychological, and that is that even though from a human standpoint it seemed like they had their bases covered, they recognized that there was a guilt between them and God who knew what they had done. And they also recognized within their own conscience that there was no relief 
And so for 27, at least 27 years, they lived with this guilt of what they had done. And as you remember, the story tells us a famine came in the land until finally it became so severe that they had nothing to eat. And so these 10 brothers were assigned the task of going down to Egypt, down to the place where they had sold their, the, where the slave traders were headed when they had sold their brother. They have to go down there now. And, and you can't help but think that maybe in the back of their minds, there was some thought of, I wonder if Joseph is still alive down there. But they've got other pressing concerns. They have to feed their family. And so they go there. And when they get there, they're forced to go before this prime minister of Egypt who is in charge of the distribution of all of the the grain that has been stored up in seven good years for the relief of the famine in these seven lean years. And they come before him and they make their request for grain. And it's just sort of odd How interested this man of great stature and power, how interested he is in them. How interested he is in their family and in their father. And how much detail he seems to almost intuit about them. He knows their birth order and other strange things, but they never suspect that this is Joseph. But Joseph wants to test them, and through a series of unfortunate events, they find themselves at last groveling before his feet, pleading for their lives because they are facing a charge of being spies sent out to find the weakness in the land by a foreign power. And under the threat of imprisonment or enslavement or perhaps even death, they plead for mercy. And in that moment, their 27 years of repressed guilt surfaces. And they say to one another in Genesis 42, 21, in truth, we are guilty concerning our brother and that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. And then Reuben, the oldest brother, in verse 22, summarizes it perfectly. He says to them all, so now there comes a reckoning for his blood. What a powerful statement. Look at our disastrous consequence we've brought on ourselves. Now there comes a reckoning for his blood, for the wrong that we had committed against him. And when Joseph then finally reveals his identity to his brothers, they're terrified and sure that he will exact his vengeance, but instead they are shocked to discover him extending forgiveness and showing them kindness. But that fear continued to linger for his brothers even after Joseph had said, I forgive you and had shown them his kindness because at the very end of the story, at the end of his life, you remember what happens When Jacob, their father, finally dies, they say to themselves in Genesis 50, the last chapter of the book of beginnings, they say, now that our father is dead, Joseph will show his anger and pay us back for all the wrong that we did to him. Once more, Joseph has to reassure them that that's not the case. But I think that there are a lot of people who live out much of their lives the way that Benjamin Martin, the character who made that statement at the beginning of The Patriot, or Joseph's brothers live their life. They long fear that the sins of their past will come back to haunt them and that the cost will be more than they can bear. And maybe even you or I here this morning are living our lives under that burden under that consciousness of guilt, under that fear of reprisal for deeds done in the past and covered over. And it may be the case that we have good reason to be afraid. The Bible tells us that God is a God who reveals secrets. He brings to the surface things that have long been buried. And Jesus himself warns that What is done in secret will be shouted from the rooftops. And maybe we're afraid because 
Well, the thing that we did to try to cover up our guilt was a deception, was a lie, or maybe even some kind of a cheap sacrifice that was enough to deceive a father like Jacob, but certainly not enough to deceive the Almighty God who knows and who sees everything. Maybe we are like Joseph's brothers in that we think, well, well, time will take care of it. The, the deeds that I have done that I fear will come back to haunt me were, were so far in the past, but these brothers went on for over nearly three decades before it was ever surfaced. Or we think maybe, maybe we can put enough distance between ourselves and sin. Some people are always on the move, and, and maybe that's part of the reason for it. We're afraid of what's going to catch up with us. So we put enough miles between us and what we did that we think that that will take care of it. But what do you do when you deal with an omnipotent, an omnipresent, an omniscient God who is always present, who always knows? Or maybe we feel like if I just feel badly enough about what I did, if I just grovel enough, if I just feel guilty enough, maybe that will be sufficient. But I think like Joseph's brothers, deep down, we know that it's an insufficient thing. You know, they had taken a goat, sacrificed it, part of their livelihood, in order to deceive their older brother. But the Hebrew writer says in chapter 10, verse 10, that, I'm sorry, 10, verse 4, that it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. You know, I love the simple lyrics of the old hymn, um, Nothing But the Blood, I think that's the name of it, where he asks the question, what can wash away my sin? And it's powerful answer, nothing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon, this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not not of good that I have done, not of some other sacrifice that I can make, not some lie that I can concoct to cover my sin, but the blood of Jesus. And it's so scriptural because as the Hebrew writer who had made the statement that, blood, that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin also says a few verses later in verse 10, we have been, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And in verse 17, he adds, their sins and their lawless acts, I will remember no more. Think about that. Not because of some cheap sacrifice or deception that we come up with can we cover the guilt of our past, but God in his infinite love for us provides a way, provides a sacrifice that is actually sufficient to carry away our guilt so far that God will remember it no more that he will remove it as far as the east is from the west. And this doesn't mean that God is forgetful or incapable. It means in terms of how he is going to relate to you and to me, he chooses by virtue of the death of Jesus never ever to, to bring that up or to make that a part of the relationship between himself and you. And if God can forgive us of our sins through the death of his son, who died in our place, then we can forgive ourselves. And we can once and for all leave behind that lingering guilt, that cloud that hangs over our head that makes us fear that the sins of our past will someday catch up with us and the cost will be more than I can bear. It says finally in Hebrews 9, 13, That while the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean so that they can be outwardly clean, how much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, 
cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. You see, God wants two things to happen. He wants wants us to be forgiven of our guilt in terms of our relationship with him vertically, but he also wants us to experience the, the freedom and the cleansing of our conscience when we also recognize what's been done to set us free from the burden of our sin. And there's no greater praise and honor and glory that we can give to Christ this morning as we come to his table than to truly let that cloud lift. If we've repented of our sins, if we've confessed them, if we've been washed in his blood in baptism, then we are invited to come to his table, which is not only a memorial of the, of the blood and body that he gave to procure our forgiveness, but is also a meal in which we have a tangible, we could even say edible evidence that we are now at peace with God. Joseph's brothers lived in constant doubt and fear, but you don't have to live that way. Here's the evidence. Sit down, eat, and drink, all of you. This time, we're going to ask the men who are going to serve the supper to come forward and take their places, and Josh Doris will lead us in prayer, and we'll partake of this supper together.